Good morning, everyone. My name is Navneet Sharma, and I have uh, two of my distinguished guests, Mr. G.R. Shivakumar and Ms. Uh, Dr. Sanjukta Shivakumar. Hello. I think that both of you are well known in your fraternity. But nevertheless, uh, as all of you know, both of them have done a great deal of uh, not only study, but practice of the multiple intelligences framework. And that is the reason uh, which has brought both of them uh, on this platform. We will start the webinar uh, in a short while. Uh, please bear with us uh, just uh, a few minutes. I think people are still logging in. So we will start in a few minutes. In the meantime, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Shivakumar, may I uh, request you to please uh, uh, share with our audience a little bit about yourself, about your uh, journey, your professional life, etc. Yes, uh, my name is Shivakumar and I've been a teacher for over uh, nearly two and a half decades. And uh, in that, I have uh, set up the Delhi Public School Surat. And uh, after that, I've moved on now. And then for some time, I was for about five years, I was the director and uh, mentor of uh, the some of the Delhi public schools, which were run by one of the trust. And then uh, right now, I have taken over as uh, principal of uh, Tapti Valley International School at Surat. Now, my interest in MI goes back a long time, about 15 years ago, when I started DPS Surat, where I tried to implement a lot of things. Uh, with with some understanding, but without a lot of understanding. So I've along the way in the last 15, 20 years, I've learned a lot from that. So I thought it would be good for me to share my experiences with uh, uh, many of you who are already maybe practicing uh, MI people or uh, would like to do that in future. So th that's me, right? Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Sanjukta Shiv Kumar. I I'm a teacher and uh, I have taught in schools as well as university and college, Loreto College, Calcutta, and then uh, Assam Valley School, and then straight over to DPS Surat. And I have been the founder principal of DPS Tapi since 2009. My interest in MI is uh, practically uh, co terminus with uh, my husband's. We got interested in MI at about the time the first book was published in 1983, 84, uh, the Frames of Intelligence. And uh, we got very interested in multiple intelligences because they were talking about applications of multiple intelligence, Project Zero and all that. And uh, I did some research. Uh, my interest in MI became even more in intense when I started research. Incidentally, I started research doing MI with students. Then, uh, that being very successful, I became more interested. And I started doing MI with teachers because after all, it is teachers who interface with students directly. And uh, I found it was not that successful when I was working with teachers. And when you come across a problem, that is when you realize that you need to study the concept more carefully. And I think the most practical takeaway for me from MI was that it is not a theoretical knowledge. It is something that you need to practice. MI is actually brain based. It is connecting to the various centers of the brain. And if you are not using your multiple intelligences, then there is a little chance of your succeeding working with others. Um, that's about me. And I think uh, we expect Dr. Sharma to take it forward from here. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sanjukta Shivakumar. And my name is Navneet Sharma. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am Dean of the uh, Dean at the School of Business at Vijayabhumi University. And uh, it's, it's a distinct pleasure uh, uh, to, to be able to converse with all of you on a subject which is of critical importance. Uh, uh, it has, uh, as Dr. Sanjukta Shivakumar mentioned, uh, it has been there uh, for last several years, but uh, I think uh, as the title uh, indicates, we are revisiting it in 2020. 
And so therefore, I would like to uh, add to your uh, reference and perhaps refre refresh your uh, thought process in terms of the challenges uh, which our economy, which our education system, all of these are facing. So that will be my uh, uh, that will be my immediate uh, uh, role here. And of course, we will have we will we would like to keep this uh, more as a conversation and uh, less as a mono monologue. Uh, what I would like to request uh, all the participants is that uh, there is a chat box uh, on the right panel. So whatever reflections you have, whatever questions you have, uh, please please feel free to uh, type those in in the chat box. Uh, uh, my colleagues and I will continue to look at the chat box and we will answer on the uh, on on suitable occasions in between. And of course, towards the end, we will have uh, uh, some time for a dedicated. Uh, question answer session. So therefore, uh, please try to make this process as interactive as possible. And that will be our effort. To begin with, as I mentioned, uh, to begin with, uh, my, my intention at the outset is to share with you the uh, share with you the immediate challenges which our economy and our industrial uh, set up our industrial organization and education infrastructure faces. Uh, and in, I, I would like to draw your attention to one word uh, that is uh, industry 4.0. Let me uh, let me try to uh, take you to a small uh, presentation which will run across the present uh, across the webinar. So. Uh, This is the structure we are going to follow. So uh, I would first like to take you uh, a little bit of discussion on the industry 4.0 and gig economy. And then we will quickly uh, delve into what is multiple intelligences framework. And then the most important part, how multiple intelligences, intelligences framework can be of some help, some assistance to all of you. And we would like to then uh, understand it from the point of view of students, teachers, and principals. And uh, in that, I think uh, the presence of my distinguished colleagues here will be of great importance because I have uh, two distinguished uh, principals who have used this. So therefore, you will be able to uh, take away some uh, very, very valuable and uh, uh, usable points from here. Uh, the first, as I mentioned, Industry 4.0, all of us are now witnessing uh, what you call technology-driven disruptions in the market structures. And therefore, there is emergence of new business models. Uh, the Ola and Uber and Swiggy and Zomato and Book My Ticket, all these companies never existed. These are new phenomena. And these market structures, these companies have emerged primarily because technology has made it possible for these companies to emerge. Therefore, what uh, we need to understand uh, what you would uh, hear in popular parlance, a term called gig economy, where uh, the, the, the norms of the game, the rules of the game are vastly different. The nature of the jobs is vastly different. So therefore, we need to understand, and it is because of these changes that the question uh, I have raised here today, that how useful is multiple intelligences framework in these times has arisen. This is the premise, ladies and gentlemen. And therefore, all of us who are educators are uh, required to now ponder over these questions as to what MI framework can help, uh, help us in terms of leveraging the effectiveness of our education system. Let me spend about uh, 30 seconds on this slide, evolution of work, where if you see this uh, uh, from hierarchy to flattened structure, from fixed working hours to flexible working hours, from uh, hoarded information to shared information, 
there are uh, you know vast changes which have happened the work is as as uh, we are we are attending this uh, webinar amidst the effects of covid 19 most of us are working from home this is a special situation but imagine if this situation were to persist like this permanently if this becomes the norm what happens what kind of humans what kind of competencies what kind of mental makeup will be required to survive in this kind of setup therefore the question of lifelong learning lifelong employability have become extremely critical and therefore the question of multiple intelligences and as a teacher as an administrator when i think of my student uh, i think of only two questions when i put myself in the shoes of a student i think of two questions first question what is my passion in simple language it is of critical importance for me to understand what is the passion of a student how can my student discover his or her passion this is the first central question and uh, if if you are able to see that if you're able to see the picture here it is a mismatch of the passion and the job where a lady who is pictorially depicted as a dancer is doing is performing the task of a uh, signal controller so there is a mismatch between the two so therefore discovering the passion and aligning the passion with the uh, with the professional interests and academic interests become uh, of critical in interest so therefore the second question is how can my student prepare him or herself for the chosen career and ladies and gentlemen you will understand that the preparation starts from the school itself it is not it, it doesn't start at the university level and therefore as a new university uh, as vijayabhumi university we have taken the initiative to roll out this series of uh, future of education and this is the second webinar uh, in which we are talking about the multiple intelligences framework today on uh, 10th of april so therefore having uttered these two questions uh, let me now uh, spend another minute to first showcase to you uh, what howard gardner has to say about multiple intelligences and then i will invite my distinguished colleagues to provide their reflections i will share the link of this video uh, with all of you uh, don't worry so you can uh, so let me uh, i i thought it would be a great idea to uh, listen with dr gardner himself what he had to say about these uh, uh, these multiple intelligences but uh, uh, let me tell you ladies and gentlemen uh, as dr sanjukta said in his famous book uh, frames of mind and with a subtitle the theory of multiple intelligences dr howard gardner who uh, who was working at the howard university provided us this framework and initially he gave us eight and then subsequently one more got added so these nine multiple intelligences are uh, logical mathematical uh, wherein a person's ability to apply logic or apply mathematical formulation in a particular setting is is what is accentuated so there what dr gardner said that looking at intelligence on a on a single parameter would be grossly uh, inadequate so therefore he said that a person's intelligence has to be looked at from the multiple angles and therefore saying that a, a class is equal and it has to be taught in a uniform manner it has to be assessed in a uniform manner is grossly inadequate this was the basic premise in which he gave us these nine uh, intelligences and uh, on a lighter note uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, the computer even today you know refuses to take intelligences as a correct word it still takes intelligence and not intelligences just to uh, just to showcase you how our program is yet to cope with this theory which was given in 1983 the second is verbal linguistic where a person is good at uh, you know uh, linguistic skills good at convincing others uh, good at you know 
using the words. Somebody may be good at visual spatial. The sense of space can be great with somebody. Somebody, somebody can be good, good with audio, audio, good with musical instruments, good with the sense of the music. Similarly, uh, a person's uh, physical strength or ability to maneuver the physical activities, physical kinesthetics could be great. There could be people who are great at understanding others. Uh, uh, an example is, uh, for example, all the influencers. You know, these are people who have great interpersonal skills. There can be persons who are very good with themselves, intrapersonal. There are people who understand themselves and therefore these inward looking people can be great at, at some things. Similarly, there are people who are great at connecting with nature, naturalistic. So therefore, uh, they connect with nature, with animals, with plants, with environment. All of this could be fantastic and then existentialist where the sense of existence could be quite accentuated a very very quick introduction uh, of the nine intelligences which were given to us by dr uh, howard gardner and i think uh, to take it further and how they manifest with kids uh, let me now invite uh, dr sanjukta shivakumar uh, to, to provide us a sense of how these nine intelligences uh, are relatable with students or children. Dr. Sanjukta Shivakumar, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Now, uh, as uh, you've already done a quick recap of the intelligences, uh, the thing is that each of these is not referring to any one capacity. It is referring to an entire spectrum. And uh, it is not that you're going to learn how to use your intelligence in a new way. What I'm here to point out is that we are already using these intelligences, but probably not as completely as we might be able to do. Now, one of the things is that, uh, would you like to say something? One of the things is that uh, Howard Gardner himself said that kids go to school and college and get through but they don't seem to really care about using their minds. School doesn't have the kind of long-term positive impact that it should. Now, this is something I think as educators, we ourselves have noticed that our uh, education system is entirely exam-centric. We may do a lot of things up to class eight, but from class nine to class 12, we are, whether it is parents or whether it is uh, principals and definitely teachers who are caught in between, are only focused on examinations. And uh, in a way, this is changing the way in which we are addressing these problems because we are supposed to be at the center of education. We are supposed to be community leaders. I don't mean principals alone. I mean people in schools. We are supposed to be leading the community with ideas. Instead, what has happened is that we cater to what parents demand. And the kind of student we create is not necessarily the kind of student we would like to create. So we need to look at MI today from the point of view of students, from the point of view of teachers, as well as from uh, uh, how we can use it or how we are already using it and we can maximize it. Because one of the things that Howard Gardner had said was that MI is one way of properly utilizing our very precious human resources. If we do not give value to all the eight intelligences that you see on the screen, then it will not be possible for us to harvest the full potential of our society. So when we look at the student, Verbal linguistic intelligence becomes something with which you negotiate meaning. Meaning is a very important aspect of life. How you go through uh, texts, how you go through information, how you navigate information, how you select and process information, because we live in a world that is extremely uh, information dense. We get much more information when we uh, search on a search engine than we can actually cope with. So being able to read, being able to understand, being able to process and being able to negotiate with language on different registers that and in different subject domains. This is a very important skill for students. Would you like to add something? And, and, and uh, 
these two, the first two, the verbal linguistic intelligence and the uh, logical mathematical intelligence, these are the two which we have been going on for a very long time and too much of emphasis has been given on this. Of course, it is important. It is important for their real world, the life after school. It is very important. But um, we'll come to that after we look at the other intelligences, how we can uh, build everything into it and take it, uh, do it in a better way, integrate it and do it in a better way. Yeah. When we think of mathematical logical, we are not just thinking of their maths ability, but also their uh, capacity to manage time. I think you will agree with us that children today have a much more crowded timetable with much more to do than probably the, it was the situation was around 10, 20 years back. So time management and critical thinking, prioritizing, selecting what needs to be done, when it needs to be done, and uh, how, to do, how to go about it without getting discouraged and also problem solving strategizing all this is part of the logical mathematical intelligence then uh, visual spatial visual spatial is actually imaginative deployment of learning strategies on task if you think a little visual spatial is not just artistic qualities it is not just the ability to uh, think three dimensionally as architects do but visual spatial is also the way you use visuals in order to think. Many of us use planners. Uh, those who are language teachers, they use uh, mind maps. Even for uh, teaching science, sometimes mind maps are useful. And uh, without diagrammatic representation of text, sometimes things are not clear. So the visual spatial intelligence is a very important problem solving intelligence. Now, these are the three, as uh, Mr. Shivakumar said, these are the three intelligences that our syllabuses give maximum weightage to. From the next onwards, the weightage comes down. When you come to physical fitness, stamina, endurance, balance, various uh, skills, these, pardon? Fine. Yeah, the fine motor skills as well as the gross motor skills. These are the areas in which uh, as children grow older, we do not really give much focus. CBSC is changing the emphasis now. They have brought back physical education as a compulsory mandatory daily activity in the school timetable. Uh, if we move on to musical rhythmic intelligence, we shouldn't just think of hobbies or uh, something that they take part in in order to win prizes. It is more a question of expanding your skill set and maybe even taking up uh, a career in music. It is not necessarily to be sidetracked. We normally give one or two periods to music, dance, instrumental, vocal. These are a very small percentage of our timetable. But actually, these are also important human resources which children do not really get a chance to explore. And then we come to the next two, interpersonal and intrapersonal. I think we all know that whatever we have learned and whatever examinations we have passed probably help us. 20% uh, of that is still of use now. The remaining 80% is how good our people skills are and how good our self-management is. So if, we, if there is no teamwork, if there is no tolerance of differences and if there is no ability for conflict management then and that is partly the reason why our schools have so many counselors in order to deal with the constant uh, conflict that is happening and intrapersonal intelligence is i think the most important thrust of intrapersonal intelligence is learning to take responsibility for your own decision making and thus to move to transition from a guided framework of where your parents are telling you what to do, your teachers are telling you what to do, you're constantly being led to taking responsibility for yourself and becoming an autonomous learner. And uh, the last that I'm dealing with here where students are concerned is naturalistic intelligence. I think this has become a crying need of the day. Environmental issues, issues like global warming and climate change and uh, pandemics, uh, the frequent recurrence of pandemics in the global scenario, all these are extremely relevant. If we thought it was not relevant, something happening in Wuhan is none of our business. Now we realize it is very much our business. And this earth is what we are handing over to our future generations. They should know what a mess we have made of it and how they have to now 
think differently from us. So this is MI as far as students are concerned. Dr. Sharma, if I, if you, if you don't mind, I think we need to allow the participants to join in with questions or whatever at this stage, because there, I can see a lot of uh, comments where some people are unable to join or unable to see the audio video. I would like to hear their inputs. Yeah. So I think if you, if you look at the chat box, uh, there's a question from uh, uh, Ms. Mukta Chatterjee that please elucid yeah. elucidate existentialist intelligence a bit more. There's a question from yes. Ms. Chatterjee. I was going so, to go into existential intelligence when we go to the teachers, so but please. Th these, these two are pretty interesting. The existential intelligence, which is uh, a recent thing, 2015, Howard Gardner brought it in. Uh, these are big questions which we ask ourselves. Uh, where do we come from and where did life come from and what happens to us after that? These are these big questions that we want answers to. And teenagers, you'll find teenagers are very interested. Teenagers are very interested. And uh, even the people, retired people are more concerned. People who are nearing their death are more concerned about what happens to them after uh, life. Uh, so these are these big questions which uh, so uh, Howard Gardner identified this as one of the intelligences scientifically it is still in the process if you see uh, in many of the papers it will be added as the uh, ninth intelligence and there's one more uh, which he has identified as pedagogical intelligence this is very very interesting because you must have seen most of your principals and uh, teachers you must have seen there could be a very good art teach art artist or a musician who can play the instrument fantastically he can uh, good at art who can do paintings wonderfully but when it comes to teaching people he can't do it he really can't do it so this pedagogical intelligence is the next thing which gardner has added to his list and uh, this is work in progress as we speak today and and there is very interesting things you can also observe amongst your teachers amongst even amongst your TA students some of them are able to explain certain things so beautifully to other children so this is an intelligence which he has identified so this is an ongoing process i think there is no dearth of uh, uh, the intelligences within us, people will be finding out. But let me put this whole thing in context. Now, uh, listening to this Harvard Gardner's theory and getting excited in one uh, meeting like this about 15, 20 years ago, I went on to, I thought I should make a school like this with all the intelligences and everything. So I went around looking at schools and some people have set up MI schools, multiple intelligences schools. And they had centers for kinesthetic intelligence, the center for linguistic intelligence. It was very interesting. Then uh, I tried it out in my school and it was an utter failure. We set up a lot of things. It was not working because the time you have is limited. And how do I bring in all these things? And if I start doing one, one inter just for two intelligences, which uh, the IQ wants, uh, the, the verbal and the logical mathematical, just for that, it takes up all our time. How do I bring in all these things? And I got the answer from, again, Howard Gardner. He made a wonderful statement over here, and I'll uh, quote, his, quote him. MI is not an educational end. It is most useful as an educational means to a publicly stated goal. This is wonderful, and this hit me hard. So you might be a CBSE school where there is the stated goal by the board or your school or your district or wherever it is. Or it could be a IB board or a IGCSE board or ICSE, whichever board you are. The goals are stated. So don't try to make those your goal, MI as your goal. These are just the means to that educational end. MI is not an end but it is the means so i'll give you a simple example where all of us can uh, understand this if you have taught history and then uh, and i want to individualize that um, teaching so how do i do that so when i finished with let's say i finished with the topic on history and then i could the the the, assess, the the way i teach them could be involving all these multiple intelligences i might be using a dvd i've got visual spatial intelligence over there i might be making seals of the harappan civilization and things like that so that could be another uh, intelligence over there i could be telling a story so that is narrative so that is 
and I could be doing physical kinesthetic. It involves all these things. So it's not, and, and even in your assessment, you could be using all these tools. For example, you might be, the child might be drawing something, you might be painting something. The child will tell you a story about that. You can ask the child to tell you a story. You can ask the child to make something out of uh, something else, uh, uh, the, the uh, project work and all these things you do. So it is, it is not as if this multiple intelli these intelligences are all operating in isolation. They are all there all around us. And some of the children may be good at drawing and putting forward their uh, ideas. Some of them may be good at narrating stories and they're putting forward their ideas. Some of them may be good at computer drawing and they might be putting forward their ideas using graphics. Some of them may be good at photography and doing things. So this is what hit me. And I'm just speaking from experience. Then my whole view changed because I was wondering in a CBSE school, maybe you have 40 students in a class. In an IB school, maybe 20. The strength varies between 20 to 40. How do I individualize these instructions? And MI is a beautiful, beautiful way of doing this in the classroom. There is no, let me make this very clear, there is no hard and fast rule that this is how it should be done. That's the beauty of this MI, uh, the multiple intelligences theory. And I'll give you one more example um, before. Uh, uh, Dr. Sharma, do I have some time for yes, one more example? Ahead. Please so, ahead. Uh, I run a photography club for children in school. And uh, I tie up a lot of things over here. And before CBSE uh, brought back the examinations in grade 10, uh, they used to have those continuous assessment and children were relatively less stressed out and they were learning much more than what they are doing again now. So uh, during this photography club, I, I found initially there were the enrollment was huge. Actually, there were 200, 300 students enrolling every year and learning. This is a 10 day course which I used to offer. And uh, what I found was it is a great opportunity for us teach them science, to teach them very complicated uh, uh, the principles in physics. Uh, uh, how does light operate? How, how does uh, you learn how to appreciate a lot of things? Composition, you're teaching them the aesthetic values, you're teaching them uh, art, you're teaching them. And when we do bird photography, you're teaching them biology, you're teaching them environmental awareness, what happened to the wetlands. So this is a whole lot of things put together. So it depends on how you want to use this MI theory. Again, I've used this. This is all tied together. If focal length, if I go and draw a diagram on the blackboard with a lens and explain to them, they are not going to understand. But conceptually, if I use a camera, I use the lens and I tell them what happens to the focal length, uh, what happens to the picture when I increase the focal length, when I decrease the focal the understanding is wonderful. So you bring all these things together and MI is a great tool. Don't look at it in isolation. Don't look at all those intelligences in isolation. Please put them all together and uh, use it as a teaching tool, as a learning tool. It, it, it would work wonders for you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sharma. Carry on. Any other? Uh, Just to uh, uh, Mr. Shivakumar, I am I am tempted to share with you one example which I have done with my own son who is writing IGCSE this year. Right. And where I have demonstrated with the help of photography, I have right. taught him English language. Wow. <laughs> let me let me illustrate my own experience now. Right. So the, right. my son right. asked me a question. Uh, the, the difference of uh, usage of passive and active voice. Mm -hmm. In a statement, I have to use, I have to mention multiple persons. And I, and I told him that exactly the way you focus with a camera, the language is also a focus. Right. If focus is on a plant, then the, the language will focus on the plant and not on the cutter. If the focus is on the cutter, then the, the then naturally the language will place adequate emphasis on the cutter and not on the plant. So with the help of a focus of the camera, I have explained to my son the uh, the manner of active and passive voices. But uh, that's a small anecdote uh, to both of you. But I have uh, before we go ahead further, I want to ask a question more as a parent and less as an educator. Yes. Uh, uh, see, as as educators as principals or teachers or counselors, uh, there is an unevenness in the mind of the principal. Certain intelligences are more valued and others are less valued. 
so the level playing field is not even right so the, the, yeah. how do we create a culture where the multiple intelligences can be looked at evenly that's more of a fundamental question and it becomes uh, particularly more important for those schools which are beginning now if you could share yes. with your experience both of you so, so, so that has to first start with the teacher uh, before we i can see a lot of comments over here saying that even during the pandemic my par uh, the parents are asking us about the next exam but nothing else but the exam yes. so our system is focused on that but now i think the boards are changing their focus the world is changing very fast and this pandemic has taught us a lot as to how we have to the the, the four pillars how do we coexist amongst each other uh, sharing caring doing all the things uh, so so now th it's very important that we uh, the teacher the teacher has a good understanding of uh, how we go about it uh, don't give in to uh, parents who are focused uh, you know why they are doing that parents are a little worried because in the real world is demanding that our system when they leave their grade uh, 12 and uh, when they go into the real world uh, the universities are looking for that and and, and but this is changing with uh, universities like uh, Vijay Bhumi and all the other universities coming up with a different kind of a, uh, uh, focus. Uh, I think this is changing. You don't have to worry only about engineering and medicine and the traditional uh, route. So there are options for our children now. Now we can talk to the parents and tell them that, look, we can take it to a different place. The world is different now. And as you said rightly, uh, you pointed out in your introduction, that we do not know what the next job is going to be. What is the next good job is going to be? I can see all the tech guys jumping up and down because everyone wants video conferencing. They are so happy. I saw the Cisco chief talk to the TV. He's so upbeat about it, but some other people are not so upbeat. So things will change and, and uh, we, we do not know what the next job is going to be. So we need to get our children ready for that next job. And uh, we need to actually sell this idea. The teacher has to actually convince the parent. I don't want to use the word sell this idea. Convince the parent that the world today is a different world we live in where everything is important. Now, if you're asking about music and art, this is what people ask most of the time. But I can tell you uh, there are no historians available. You can ask the principals, how many of you have got good history teachers? They will say, no, we don't have. So th this is going to be a cycle. One subject is going to take over. Now you've got engineers who want to teach pre-primary classes also. They don't mind. B techs, M techs, they don't mind teaching. So this is happening. This is a cycle which will go on. But we need to do, we need to put forward to children what is best for their life, not just for uh, their career it's for their life how do they enjoy their life as a species now this is again coming from the mi as a species this is again howard gardner's words it's not mine he says that birds may be good at one multiple intelligence or two or some other uh, animals may be good at something else but human beings homo sapiens are the only species which have all these in us and it's not equal amongst us it's different the uh, Seven billion people have got different, different. Multiple. There's no two people who you can say that the intelligences are equal, and you should never try to make it equal. Also, which is not possible. So, uh, and I think it's right. ba basically the job of the teacher to, to to go back to your question. It's the teacher and Doctor, then the parent. Doctor, yes, right. Sir. Thank you, Doctor Sanjukta. There is a question here uh, from Mr. Dinesh Padwal that do we need counselors? at a very early age for, for our children to realize their passion. Would you like to answer that question? I'm looking at three questions, actually. There's one from Anjali Agarwal and earlier one about existential intelligence and this about counselors. I think the point I made with this uh, last uh, second last intrapersonal intelligence is that our children are capable of finding out what their passion is. We were capable of finding out what our passion is. If somebody else has to tell you what your passion is, then that's not your passion. That's just you being a, a follow led mentality. And nowadays, it's not so much parents it is peer pressure they want to become whatever their friends are becoming i i that's what i have noticed and uh, 
the gap between teaching, learning, application. The reason is that we are becoming more and more exam centric. Teachers first look at what is the exam paper. Then they look at the text. They select the portions of the text that are answering the exam questions and they teach that. So are you teaching a skill or are you preparing for exams? This is where the gap is. It's not so much a gap between application learning. What you learn, you can apply. But the purpose of learning is changing. And since everybody is talking about uh, everybody is talking about teaching, if we can move to the next slide, this is about teachers. If you remember, for those who joined late, right in the beginning, I told you that I'm basically an action researcher, which means that whatever I teach, I normally study the patterns that are emerging. And when I was working with multiple intelligences directly with children, I found it was very successful. When I started working through teachers, I found that I was really struggling. And that was possibly because I was not taking into account the teacher's own multiple intelligence spectrum. Now, if I am a very good music teacher, then definitely my knowledge of music is a given. I'll be able to appreciate good music and I'll be able to teach. If my pedagogical intelligence is strong, I'll be able to teach. But that doesn't necessarily mean that my uh, visual spatial or my critical thinking is equally good. Right. But a teacher I'm making it very clear over here. A teacher is one person who should try to develop all their intelligences to the extent they can. Because if you're going to deal with a diverse class, if, uh, as Sir said just now, multiple intelligences is a tool. Now, this tool you can deploy at different points of the lesson. One is how are you giving them the input? How are you explaining the concept to them? Very frequently it happens that the teacher is explaining something on the board, maybe with diagram with a proper explanation. One child or two children in the class don't understand. So he or she, the teacher, repeats the explanation in exactly the same way and still there is no communication. Now, supposing it was that focal length business that the science teacher was teaching. Supposing the science teacher brought a camera in and had a photography lesson, they would really understand what is depth of focus and what is creating it. That diagram would come to life. So you see, multiple intelligences is one way of uh, addressing the fact that children learn in different ways. OK. And then there is the other point, which is Sir is talking about assessment, the exit point. This is a, a other point of the lesson where assessment is concerned, where multiple intelligences should be applied. Now, I am a CBSE principal. I have always been pro CBSE, but for the past uh, few years, I'm, I'm not happy. I'll tell you very frankly, I'm not happy with this 80 percentage, 100 percentage marks or uh, given weightage given to the written exam, because that is not taking into account the other ways in which children can express what they have learned. What about visual spatial presentations? What about skits? What about models? What about uh, technical presentations? There are so many different ways in which children can actually demonstrate what they have learned. Right. So if this is not happening, then definitely the uh, multiple intelligence is not going to work. These are the two points of the lesson, the entry point and the exit point where MI can work. And uh, I, I'm not able to read all the uh, comments uh, at such speed, but I will go on with the slide. I hope that what I'm talking about teachers is going to answer some of uh, the questions. Of course, the remarks I agree with, but where there are questions, I'd like to go on with the slide. Uh, now, from a teaching teacher's point of view, remember I have said that MI is a spectrum. It is not one ability. Okay. So in verbal linguistic intelligence, the teacher needs to move from explaining to eliciting. Now, it depends how beautifully I can phrase the question. If I can phrase a question that is going to elicit answers from you, that is going to get you hooked, that will get you thinking, and that will get you trying to find the answer without depending on the teacher, then definitely you're already into the lesson. So from explaining to eliciting is a very good deployment of verbal linguistic intelligence where any teacher is concerned be it maths, languages, humanities, whatever. Then we come to the logical intelligence. Now, everybody who is a principal has been a teacher. Time management is the biggest 
critical thinking problem. And many of the teachers are ladies. They have families to look after. With all due respect, men do housework. Uh, ladies actually keep the house running, right? So there is uh, housework plus uh, preparing for lessons, plus counseling students. You go in to teach, then there is a fight erupting, and you look into that. And actually, a teacher's life is, uh, is a tremendous amount of juggling of uh, different balls together. And at the same time, they need to focus on the fact that there is syllabus, there is curriculum that has to be covered and delivered. So time management and structuring of tasks so that you focus on what actually the students need without wasting time doing things which they can do on their own. Because otherwise, how are you going to have autonomous learners if you're doing everything for them? Then uh, to carry on, then we come to the visual spatial intelligence. I feel that a large part of classroom management, of class management, is optimum usage of classroom space and furniture layout. I have seen teachers who stick to the board and absolutely lose connect with the other parts of the classroom. I think a good movement around the classroom and uh, arranging the furniture to allow best view of the board or the TV or the smart board, whatever it is that you're using. and. Uh, speaking from different parts of the classroom so that the entire class feels that there is no margin. The class is no part of the class is marginalized. That is visual spatial intelligence as far as the teacher is concerned. Then there is the physical kinesthetic intelligence, which is uh, not visible on this screen. But anyway, physical kinesthetic intelligence is managing student movement. Think of it from the student's point of view. The student is sitting in the classroom from morning till afternoon with very little break and very little movement, except when they go to a different class or they go out for an activity class. So allowing student movement in a very practical way is actually a physical necessity. It, and if the teacher does not have that kinesthetic ability to understand what the student is going through, then the class is not going to be successful. The musical rhythmic intelligence, see, all most people like music and can appreciate music. Even if you are not a singer, if you are able to appreciate uh, your, uh, let us say you are able to discern a raga when you listen to the notes of the raga. Think, you have very good listening skills. And a teacher needs to be a good listener. A teacher needs to have a good sense of timing. When to say what, to whom when to say now something not to say something so and a sense of structure a sense of periodicity a sense of rhythmicity something which uh, recurs because students feel comfortable in an atmosphere which is more or less set there won't be some unpredictable demands from them and uh, they know that there are certain rules in place there is a certain structure to follow and they feel safe so I think the musical rhythmic intelligence has to be used by teachers in this sense as well. And uh, then we come to the interpersonal intelligence. I think managing teachers, uh, colleagues, managing students, managing parents, managing with the principal, us, all the managing with the demands of the board, managing so many different things, and then managing job and family, all these things. The, uh, a teacher is a multitasker, a real multitasker. And she has to know, or he has to know, how to, how to get group work out of the children, how to compose the groups, how to allot different roles to different personalities in the class, how to understand each student and get the max out of that student, and also to be able to sympathize with somebody who is not getting the best out of your lesson. Usually, we as teachers are more in sync with those who are uh, listening to us and following us. Right now, for instance, I'm speaking. I can see a few comments which said that uh, I can't get the audio. I can't get the audio. Actually, we were not good. None of us, uh, we didn't focus on that. I assume there is a technical side looking after that. But there are people sitting in our classes who can't get what we are saying. We need to be in sync with them without getting too worked up that people are not following the lesson. So interpersonal intelligence is a must. must. And then we come to intrapersonal intelligence, transitioning from being class directors to participant learners. Now, we speak a lot about this. We talk about facilitating. Now, when we talk about facilitating, we need to understand that we, if we are doing all the talking, in that case, the student is not becoming a participant in the class. We are still directors. So 
a do i allow students to select what they want to learn do i allow students to structure the task as they want it to go how much freedom of choice freedom of decision making am i willing to risk with my class if i'm able to do that then i'm a real class manager if i'm the one who comes with a proper plan and after that i'm a control freak and i want everything going my way then definitely with children today uh, we know we are going to end up as very frustrated teachers so intrapersonal intelligence is accepting the fact that i'm not miss perfect over there i need to know that there are students who probably know more than me students who can access more information than me and we need to make use of all channels in order to get along as a class now i'm going to come into existential intelligence because somebody asked about it now see existential intelligence is not just a query about where did i come from and where am i going it is also a query about why am i here what am i doing here how am i functioning how do i judge how i am functioning am i a good human being now these are questions that are very important if you think a little it's very important because we are constantly judging ourselves and judging others uh, you are listening to me you are forming little conclusions in your own mind about how relevant i am or whether i am a good speaker or whether i am making any sense at all or whether i am totally off the point we are constantly judging others even as teachers we are judging students as principals we are judging teachers we are judging parents judgment is an inborn nature okay so this is where the the existential intelligence comes in because we are constantly defining self vis-a-vis -vis other okay i am like this and anybody who is like me is uh, belonging to a community of self and people who are different they are the other so entire life is lived within this framework of self versus other this is where existential intelligence comes into being and i think we need to take it into account because now multiplicity has become the way of life when we were growing up i am uh, 52 so when i was growing up things were very fixed there were certain definitions of what is acceptable what is not acceptable and uh, maybe the frameworks were very uh, definite and predictable but now multiplicity is the order of life everything has started changing people are different even the genders nowadays is more than two uh even if you look at your uh, science and evs textbook for small children you see the definition of families the concept of families which is the first thing that children learn when they come into their evs classroom all of these the definitions are changing you can be who you want to be and nobody has the right to judge you unless yes nobody has the right to judge you unless you want to uh unless you are harming or damaging somebody and this is the very important concept of self versus other if you have good existential intelligence then you will survive well in the world and uh, with that i hand it back to dr sharma i think uh, in the interest of time i need to immediately uh, invite mr shivkumar uh, to uh, to let us understand that you know uh, having understood uh the significance of mi for a learner and for a teacher how can principals uh, really help themselves and help everybody else uh be it teachers or be it students uh, the role of a principal is that of a chief enabler so therefore how can principals enable the entire um, operation of multiple intelligences in the school uh let me quickly invite mr shivkumar on this that's a very very basic uh, question because uh, in a school uh, if the teachers do not understand what the principal is trying to do and uh, then things go out of control meaning you want something and something else is happening there in the class and uh, here the problem for the teacher is the boards tell you something and there's a publicly stated goal you the goals have been given the objectives for teaching have been given by the board and uh, you are trying to do something now how do we align those two uh, the objectives of the board and the objectives as of the school actually the principal is not nothing but he's the uh, person who's making those objectives for the school 
and uh, i here i see that there should be a good relationship between the teacher and the principal where the principal has got a good rapport with the teachers and he is having the time to meet them and put forward his vision for uh, teaching for vision for teaching itself but actually there are a lot of interesting educational theories where one could get very confused for example you can very easily get confused between learning styles and mi it appears somewhat similar that's that's for uh, principals to go back and check this out what is the difference between learning styles and so it's very easy for them to get confused and the kind of uh, so, so the clarity that a principal has this is very important uh, if there's one thing which you should uh, take away it is this you should be very clear as to how you are going to it depends again on, uh, on the board which you are affiliated to they have certain objectives and then as a school you have certain objectives and as a principal as a teacher what would the objectives of the teacher be these all these should be aligned with each other uh, it, it's not a question of wanting to do mi anyone can do it because it's nothing but it's a way of sharing knowledge again this is from howard gardner mi is nothing but different ways of sharing for a teacher it is ways of sharing knowledge um uh, and, and this this could be taken to a next level where teachers can be involved and you can have another session i think for invite all the teachers and have a session with them because this is very interesting but as a school leader it's very important that uh, the teacher understands the mission and vision of the institution and especially the principal uh, the significant people in the school who actually are on the ground implementing things the coordinators or the headmasters and ministers the educational leaders in the school who are uh, doing this so uh, basically it is uh, internal thing which has to happen in the school it depends on the principal how he is able to, he or she is able to motivate the staff and uh, put forward in a clear way the vision for the school yes dr sharma i think we are running out of time uh, right so <clears throat> having having seen uh, what mi can mean to uh, students to teachers and uh, to principals uh, before uh, i in the meantime i will request uh, both mr mr and mrs uh, shivkumar to take a look at the questions i would in the meantime yes. you uh, take uh, another uh, 30 seconds to explain to you how at vijay bhumi we are making full use of the multiple intelligences theory so in this slide if you are able to see uh, we have certain practice courses i will give you one one or two quick examples for example in order to develop uh, the uh, naturalistic or existentialist uh, uh, you know intelligence we have something called uh, social immersion program where in a student uh, in a structured two week uh, immersion is is asked to look at the social problem and structure the problem and structure a solution and give it back to the stakeholders it's a structured exercise for which credit hours are assigned and the student is assessed just to give you one instance similarly the personality enhancement program is is again a pedagogical uh, intervention of vijay bhumi wherein we try to see that not only in terms of body uh, bodily kinesthetics in terms of knowing your body knowing your mind and knowing others all through the duration of the degree a student is put to uh, certain interventions to remain healthy in terms of body mind and interpersonal skills so these are uh, like this these are some of the practice courses if you look at the right block column Uh, the courses are uh, structured at three levels l0 l1 and l2 l0 are the courses which are offered in the first year in the first year a student is asked to take uh, 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 you know uh, two courses from eight from uh, eight baskets and this is what we call the discovery process when you study multiple subjects you discover where am i good at uh, i am good at what are my strengths what are the areas where my natural strength doesn't lie so this is the discovery process we facilitate in the first year the student goes to the second and third year and at the l1 and l2 level variety of courses are offered in in the form of majors and minors 
so uh, uh, as a as a disrupting force in the higher education space we we are allowing students to uh, when a student joins us for a bba you could study marketing with data science and design all the three come together we do not put those kind of restrictions similarly somebody who is studying communication design at our university can study marketing and sales uh, in order to understand the customer psychology fully and be a better communication designer similarly a data scientist wishes to study uh, let's say corporate social responsibility we will allow that so that one can combine the two similarly in terms of learning pathways not only the substantive learning pathways but institutional learning pathways wise we also are forging partnerships with institutions of higher learning in india and in other countries so that uh, some of the not so well known but forward looking futuristic specializations such as sports management such as luxury management even those could be offered to students who are interested in studying those so therefore we need a liberal thought process and uh, and we proudly claim that we are india's first liberal professional university uh, uh, which is offering such a liberal framework to our student so that they can not only discover themselves but also study anything uh, within the four schools in the in this year we have four operational schools school of business design law and data science so this is our approach of freedom and choice in one word i think choice is a very very important term in terms of our curriculum architecture before i close i think we we have a few minutes left so let me uh, take you back to mr mr shivakumar we have some questions i think you could answer them right so uh, they're all um, very interesting practical questions which they are asking my only answer to all these questions if if you if you read the statement clearly if you go through it very carefully this is howard gardner statement mi is not an educational end it is an educational means please remember that so if you if you make it an end that's i this is the mistake i made many years ago and uh, i was looking for the right kind of mi school and it, it was a failure so mi can be done anywhere with a 40 student class with a 20 student class with a big school with a small school with school with has which has lot of funds with school which doesn't have a lot of funds you can use the mi theory everywhere and i think that will answer most of the questions which are coming out over there and these are all pretty uh, uh, relevant questions for a school teacher or for a school and a school principal Yes, ma'am. You have anything? There is a question that has just come up. How reliable are MI tests? Now, MI tests are not uh, to be assessed with the usual uh, rubric. Mm -hmm. It's not a pen and paper test unless you are assessing the verbal, linguistic, or mathematical, logical, or visual, spatial. Otherwise, uh, you can have a, a wide spectrum. There is a entire lot of study on and publications on the rubrics the various rubrics that even teachers can develop for mi tests now there are two kinds of tests here one is you can take a test to allow the student to find out what is their own mi spectrum and the other is uh, the test which is allowing students to express their learning in different ways so definitely if you are going to take a live presentation of something a technical presentation of something then definitely the rubrics are going to be different from the kind of rubric that you would use to mark a pen and paper test even in pen and paper test the way you would assess a multiple choice question test and the way you would assess a short answer or a long answer test it would vary so definitely mi tests are extremely reliable it will be as reliable and valid as your rubric is valid and And reliable. Yes, Dr. Sharma. Dr. Sharma. Thank you. Let me. Uh, I think it has been it has been a great uh, experience and interaction uh, with all of you. Uh, let me let me try once again if I can uh, if I can play the video of uh, Dr. Howard Gardner for you uh, and uh, and end this webinar uh, for you uh, in his own words. let me try Dr. this Dr. Sharma some of the some of the participants could not see the presentation so please upload the presentation for them so that uh, so that they can access, access it later, it later. Maybe on yes your, we will uh, do 
but let me in the in the meantime try to uh, share the presentation let me see if it works is it is the audio coming If you if you attach a speaker to your laptop, maybe we can hear the audio. I can hear something. I think it's not working. So therefore, I have put the link in the chat box. Uh, you no. can enjoy the video at your own leisure. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It has been such a great pleasure. Greatly appreciate all of you taking time. Uh, and I hope uh, you have found uh, value out of this. We will continue this conversation. As I said, this is a series on the future of education. Today is the second uh, webinar in this session, uh, and we will continue to update you uh, in this series. And, and at the end, let me thank uh, profusely both uh, Dr. Sanjukta Sh uh, Shivakumar and uh, Mr. Shivakumar. Thank you very much. Have a, have a great day.